Good afternoon and welcome to this new webinar from ERA, the European Union Agency for Railway. I'm Cyril Martin, Communication Officer, and I will be your moderator today. When traveling by train, have you ever wondered how important data is? From the design of the railway vehicle to the operational data exchange needed to perform the trip, data is everywhere. To tackle these questions, we will today focus on one specific use of the railway data at the stage of the route compatibility check. We will have a round table with our three guest speakers, guests that are very honored to welcome and introduce. Mr. Hans Schmidt, compatibility officer, rolling stock at ProRail, and chairman at EIM, working group rolling stock. EIM is the European Rail Infrastructure Managers, representing 60 members managing more than 50% of the European Union's railway lines. Then Mr. David Dowie, head of the data information and knowledge management sector in DigiDigit, the European Commission's Directorate General for the Informatics. Mr. Ivo Velichkov, linked data consultant and trainer working with DigiDigit. And Hank Mulder, head of digital cargo at IATA, International Hair Transport Association, and team lead for the semantic modeling in DTLF, the Digital Transport and Logistics Forum. You, dear attendees, are most welcome to ask questions to our experts using the chat function, which you will find at the top right hand corner of your screen. You can also tag questions from other attendees, which you judge valuable by clicking the thumb icon. We commit to reply to all the questions that will be asked during the broadcast. If we don't have the time to do it live, we will publish the answers afterwards on our website. A last word to say that this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel and our website in the coming days. May I now give the floor to Joseph de Paul Bauer, the Executive Director of ERA, for some opening remarks. Unfortunately, Joseph couldn't be here with us today, so he recorded a message for us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Rail is a transport mode that is environmentally friendly and safe. But rail has also to compete with other transport modes for customers that they expect easy accessibility and reliability. More and more, the data and information associated with many physical assets in the railway system are used in order to manage rail operation. Rail digitalization, understood as better use and exchange of information in order to perform our railway business, has been growing exponentially in the last few years. However, those physical assets are scattered all over the railway topology and handled by multiple actors. The railway sector is a challenging ecosystem from the data exchange and data management perspective. But an efficient rail operation highly depends on reliable access to the data and information related to railway assets everywhere and all the time. The current legal framework determines multiple flows of data exchange between the railway sector and the agency. Here we are speaking of the data managed in the various registers operated by ERA. Those data flows have appeared gradually over time. The approach followed was to build specific applications, the registers, in order to comply with regulation and to attend that exchange. Consequently, those registers were not connected to each other. Some years ago, we at ERA have decided to get better prepared in order to adapt quicker to new legislation changes and to new user requirements. By adopting semantic web technologies to facilitate the data exchange, firstly between our own internal registers. And last year, in November 2020, the agency's management board has decided that this linked data technology would become the default setting for any future development under its remit. The options the agency had at that time were first to start from scratch a new application, again in another silo, second to make fixed interfaces and a fixed API, or third the final option and the chosen one to reuse the data we have in house and to connect it in accordance to the FAIR principles. 
findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable based on linked data. Consequently, we could avoid duplication and inconsistency. The purpose of this webinar is to share with our stakeholders the outcome of this Lighthouse project and the lessons learned in order to motivate the railway sector to adopt similar approaches to facilitate data exchange in the business to government and in the business to business arena, paving the way towards a more efficient railway sector and a more relevant role also in the multimodal chain. After a detailed explanation of the internals of our project by Uke Delzoa, the team leader data information and governance in ERA, our invited panelists will provide the railway sector point of view, the expert technology point of view and with a contribution from the aviation domain also the multimodality perspective. The agency's vision is to make railways work better also for a digital society. Thank you, Mr. Doppelbauer. There are indeed many challenges and many issues around managing data. Data are everywhere, as Ayel said, but for doing what? It goes, for example, from designing a railway vehicle or an infrastructure railway line up to a daily operation of trains or ticketing and more. And you are probably, as railway user, much more <clears throat> attentive to the performance of the railway system rather than to the pure compatibility of the railway uh, system. But historically speaking, the European railway regulation was basically architecture around two pillars to ensure safety and to ensure interoperability of the railway system. And this via two related directives. At this end, this should give the framework allowing a performant and business efficient syst railway system that makes the railway the backbone of the transport across the EU. In this regard, the European Agency for Railways has played a role since more than 15 years, contributing to the definition of a safe and interoperable environment. ERA has contributed to, with the sector to provide the Commission and the Member States with a regulatory framework that enables and facilitates the advent of a single European railway area. Across the time, many secondary legislation deriving from the Interoperability Directive and the Safety Directive have entered into force. Technical specification for interoperability, common safety methods are just examples of it. Text. <clears throat> These legal texts sorry, are aiming at defining the compliance to a commonly agreed railway system within the EU. The specification of those physical assets, the building blocks of the railway system, this specification resulted in the regeneration of a big amount of data and information. This data can be structured, as it is the case for traditional databases, for example, or less structured, like in PDF documents. All in all, the data ecosystem has grown drastically, together with the emergence of the legal text I was referring to. So, all in all, the data ecosystem has grown drastically together with the emergence of the legal text. And as I said, ERA by nature and also legally binding <clears throat> has to play a key role in hosting those data. And from there, ERA has an important role to play to govern many of the reference data related to the railway system. For those who are familiar with I can only name some of the register that the agency is hosting, like the ECVVR, ERADIS, ERATV, etc. <clears throat> only from a pure structural perspective, the ever-growing amount of data to be hosted inside the agency, mainly through register, and through the growing complexity of this data, has revealed to be a challenge because of many reasons, among with an inflation of similar but different data models leading to a high IT cost, maintenance and some flexibility issues. An inflation of application programming interfaces, APIs, to effectively access and interface those siloed packed information. As, under, as underlined by Mr. Doppelbauer, optimizing the railway operation remains a key challenge in 2020s 
and an efficient railway operation highly depends on reliable access to data information related to its constituent assets. It cannot be succeeded without achieving high accessibility to railway data and effective data exchange. Which means in a digital society to make all the data machine understandable and even more than machine readable. This concept of accessibility will be probably developed further by our next speaker, Ivo Velichkov, with a more IT insight. Today, we want to focus on the railway operation. Let's come to a specific example that has been chosen by the agency as a lighthouse project in that perspective, the route compatibility check. What it is about in general will be explained by our next <clears throat> speaker, Mr. Hans Schmidt, that will develop further the general context of route compatibility check. But let me give you some insight from our era perspective. The recent set of railway regulation, also called force railway package, entered into force in 2019, has put a focus on operation optimization. And as part of this force railway package that has been enforced, a revised technical specification for interoperability relating to the operation and traffic management, also called TSI OPE for the um, people knowing it, has been reviewed. This TSI precisely aims at harmonizing the operation and among the area to be standardized and harmonized across e Europe of compatibility between the railway vehicle and the infrastructure where the vehicle is expected to be operated. The TSI OPE specify a minimum set of vehicle characteristics to be compared to the parameters defining the infrastructure network on which the vehicle is intend intended to be operated. As we can see immediately, that's pointing two sets of data, vehicle on one side, infrastructure on the other side. So which data are we speaking about when dealing with route compatibility check? About data hosted in two different registers, ERA TV and RINF. Two registers that were created, that were populated, and that were maintained as separate repositories for years. As explained before, ERA used to host several registers in siloed approach. The cause of such siloed situation are diverse and complex. Different timing of the legal framework having led to the existence of those registers, but also diversity of the owners and actors having the governance of the data contained in those registers, and also pure IT choices across the time when deciding about the development of those registers. On one hand, we have RATV with the vehicle type characteristic, data that are registered at the moment railway vehicle is authorized to be put on the market. Several actors are involved here, front line and second line, actors like vehicle industry, the vehicle designer, but also the National Safety Authority or the agency itself as entity in charge of authorizing the vehicle. But we have also maintenance entity or operators as actors of that database when it happens to modify the vehicle across the time. On the end, on the other end, we have the RINF, the Register on Infrastructure Data, where the main actors and provider of data and owner of the data are the infrastructure managers. As we can understand, within such a context, we have multiple actors. We have a duty to compare data. All this is a nice area to tackle the challenge of managing more efficiency in the related data. As explained by Mr. Doppelbauer, we could have thought to get rid of what was existing and recreate another new repository, a new database, or we could have developed new APIs to ensure the interface between RINF and ERA TV. Instead of that, we have opted for adopting a semantic web technologies approach and to approach the, the to tackle the problem with the linked data and the knowledge graph techniques. By doing so, we have facilitated data exchange between our own internal register for achieving the necessary support that can be offered to the achievement of the root compatibility check from a data pers perspective. Faced to two different words like RINF and ERA TV, the target was to create business value by sharing the data once and in a reusable manner, once in only principle. First of all, as a first step, 
<clears throat> was to identify in a uniform way the concepts from the two databases to be compared. What we call a semantic definition of the concept and the relations to enable the interoperability between the data of the two databases. That semantic approach led to formalize a dedicated ERAT ontology. And based on that, we have built the, the knowledge graph <clears throat> that enables to uh, deploy and develop a query that is called root check compatibility. Where are we now? We are now at the start <clears throat> of a way leading to a more data-centric organization. We want to build on the experience that we have made so far in terms of linked data technology. Thanks to the collaboration with the EC Publication Office, our vocabulary is now available in VogBench. It is to be noted that we are among the pioneering European agencies publishing such a domain-specific vocabulary shared at EU level. We are also some, ki some kind of pioneers for rail vocabulary among the railway sector players. We have set up now an environment much more versatile and flexible than what we had before with the traditional database. The focus so far was um, given on the root compatibility check and has requested important effort to build the first knowledge graph and the first root compatibility check application. What we need to do now is to improve the current solution in hands before to get a fully operational environment. We need to enlarge the use of the model built by enriching with other use cases, and we need to foster the use of the data already made available to external actors through dedicated federated queries. And we can, we will post some link to some of those federated queries that we have uh, initiated recently in order for you to um, witness the power of what has been uh, deployed inside this knowledge graph. Thank you for your attention. I will give the floor to the view of the sector in order to explain in a more broader context what is the root compatibility check about, technically speaking, and why such a tool, an IT tool, can help to support a complex area as this legal duty. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Many thanks, Hugues. I will now give the floor to Hans Schmidt. Hans Schmidt, so I recall our audience that you are a uh, compatibility officer rolling stock at ProRail, and uh, you are as well a chairman at EIM, Working Group Rolling Stock, EIM being the European Rail Infrastructure Managers. So, Mr. Schmidt, three questions for you. First, how the root check compatibility process is currently taking place? What are, in a nutshell, the, the changes that were introduced by the fourth railway package? Second question, what are the additional challenges when it happens to be performed on a cross-border international basis? And then, what are, according to you, the opportunities as seen from the sector based on what the sector has experienced in developing this root check application with ERA? Please, Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, yeah, if you can please share the slides. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hans Schmidt uh, from ProRail, the Netherlands Infrastructure Manager in the Netherlands and also chairman of the EIM Working Group Rolling Stock. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, as already mentioned, I will give a, a picture from uh, infrastructure managers perspective on the, on the root compatibility check status at this moment and also the status of ERA TV and RINT as just mentioned and maybe good to know that I will do it from the perspective of the EIM working group rolling stock which is on the technical level on the interface between vehicles and infrastructure um, uh, 
at e uh, EIM, there are also working groups uh, uh, specifically for the RINF, uh, the, uh, the Register of Infrastructure, but also for the TSI operations, as mentioned just, uh, which all have a link to the RCC process. Uh, but our group is mainly focusing on the vehicle authorization process in general, and of course the updates on the TSI lock and pass and wagons uh, for the vehicle side of the of the uh, framework in Europe. And active members, as you, uh, it, it, it's a really small group, but uh, the the can countries are mentioned in this slide: Belgium, Finland, France, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. Next slide, please. Um, to give some insights in the RCC process, the RCC process was, of course, uh, uh, in uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, formulated in detail in 2019, and uh, we we uh, noticed that 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 the regulations came in force in all of our our member states of the members of our group, but uh, we also noticed that there are uh, big differences in the way uh, the country handle this new situation. Uh, um, and I will go into detail later for that, uh, on that. Um, but what, what is very interesting that uh, yeah, at, at, at the infrastructure manager site, a lot of work has been done because of course the RIN Fed, the Register of Infrastructure, uh, uh, yeah, uh, got more extra focus, uh, more than it had before maybe. But at this moment, that was an interesting, interesting finding from our side. We don't really know how the railway undertakings are currently using this approach of the route compatibility check. Uh, implicitly, they always did it in one or the other way. But that's uh, wh when we uh, try to find out what, what do we know of it, that we know little from the railway undertaking side, how they handle this uh, in detail. Um, as, you, as I already stated, at this moment we uh, take uh, we have a lot of effort to really uh, completing and and ch and checking all the data that is in RIN. Of course, are, yeah, by using it you get a lot of uh, feedback, of course, on this, and uh, it's a con continuous process at the mo uh, at the moment to improve the RIN on uh, on all the findings we get from different sources. But it's mainly on on using it and and things we find by ourselves instead of that we have a lot of input yet at this moment from the railway undertakings on this. Uh, next slide please. Uh, when when you uh, come back to the changes uh, that are introduced by the uh, fourth railway package then uh, we, we can say that the roles are uh, very well defined uh, but uh, uh, to fulfill this role and the task belonging to it, that uh, still clarifications are, are made and discussed uh, between the role, between NSA, uh, the, the national safety authorities, uh, between the railway undertakings and between the infrastructure managers. And uh, of course, the tools have been improved. The RINF is, uh, I think, the, 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 the setup is, uh, is, 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 is very well, but we notice, especially in our group between the members, that although uh, some uh, parameters in RIMP seem very obvious that we still have a lot of discussion in what is actually uh, 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 meant and what is used and uh, also the differences between the countries came up. And, uh, and as, uh, uh, in, in, in this framework also the processes have been clearly defined, but if we also look to the uh, RCC tool that was uh, uh, made, uh, then uh, um, uh, it's also important to state that if the RINF and ERA TV is not match, uh, matching, uh, uh, what what should you do then? And that's a kind of open end in the whole situation because at this moment you will find a lot of uh, uh, n not okays if you use automatic tool uh, uh, comparing ERA TV with, uh, with RINF is our uh, um, uh, experience. And maybe as a last point on this slide, uh, within our group we have a big difference uh, that uh, our French uh, uh, infrastructure manager SNCF Réseau, uh, they were in a different position because they also had a kind of responsibility in France for the route compatibility check process uh, before the fourth railway package and th that's why they had put a lot of infort, uh, uh, input in, in guiding uh, information and training of the railway undertakings to use 
the RINF or to do the route compatibility check in the right way. So that was quite different to the other countries in our group that uh, France had a very specific situation. Next slide, please. When we come to the cross-border international scope uh, in our group, we found out, uh, as I already mentioned, that there were multiple interpretations on, on the different parameters in, uh, in RIN. And we noticed that uh, discussing these points take a lot of time and efforts to, to come to a common understanding. And what, from our perspective, from the technical group, we, we, we have the feeling that this was a bit, uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, how do you say that? Uh, not 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 focused at in all the development so far, and that the developments uh, we see so far, both in the RINF but also in the RCC tool, is is very much IT led, which of course is important. But we now notice that there is some, uh, yeah, th that that the technical aspects may not be that obvious as as they seem when they are written in the TSI or in the parameters for RINF, and that's why we come to one of the challenges that we think that the arbitration is needed to 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 uh, uh, yeah to come to a, to consensus to the I think that uh, you uh, just meant the controlled vocabulary. I think that that is an important point that we should work at and I think that there also should be a, an entity that can help on that. And of course uh, you see it in the bigger picture of linked data. Uh, and information that is finally used by uh, yeah, railway undertakings, I think in general to, to make their train paths. Uh, yeah, we see also a kind of uh, yeah, an, an, a challenge in the accountability of this whole process. Of course, uh, the data in the RINF from an infrastructure manager's perspective is uh, 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 yeah, uh, the, the role for the infrastructure manager. But when you combine these things in different apps or uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, information for, uh, for a user, then there are a lot of uh, linked data and possible errors, which, which uh, we, we, we have some doubts on how this will work. So in any case, we are uh, trying to come to, uh, to the common understanding on what should be in RINF uh, to, to, to come to, uh, to the best possible data to use in this new process. Next slide, please. Um, well, uh, from our perspective, there were some opportunities because of the of the clear framework. Uh, what we already saw between the different infrastructure managers, it really helps in a kind of benchmarking between the different infrastructure managers, but also to get a very thorough uh, view on the uh, uh, networks of the different infrastructure managers. So that was already very helpful in our discussions. But as I mentioned, uh, we have already some uh, 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 challenges in this, and that's first point, of course, the data quality. So what's in RINF and also what is in ERA TV, but also the accountability, as I just mentioned, all the extra steps that are made towards, uh, 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 for instance, the, the app towards a user. There are mo many tricky, tricky points in that, uh, in our opinion. Uh, the arbitration point are already uh, uh, mentioned with when there is a difference of opinions, but also uh, I think or, or we think of course as a group that also an objective uh, cross examination of the data is needed on a yeah on a European level to be sure that it's really that the data are is really interoperable and interpretable by an an an, an European broad working uh, railway undertaking in this case. And then, uh, yeah, that's uh, maybe our final point in this is that the the uh, uh, that that also these uh, 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 technical operations perspective should be taken more into account in common uh, uh, in, in coming uh, steps on this uh, this approach because now it's very uh, yes seeing opportunity in the, in the business perspective, but this simple point of having this data. Uh, 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 complete and 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 right is a very tough point in our perspective in this whole process. So we we please uh, um, uh, yeah be aware that this use information is quickly brought into a feedback loop so that the data is improved continuously. Next slide, slide please. This is the end of my presentation. I have hope to give a give quick overview. These are my uh, colleagues uh, that you can have contact with, but of course, if you have further questions, please 
let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Indeed, <clears throat> thank you also to give the, the full view and the full complexity of the root compatibility check. Um, we totally share your view that uh, what we have done so far is uh, a tool only that allows for supporting the, the, the full process and that does not give a full solution to this complex um, <clears throat> problem. Anyway, we are strongly uh, convinced that by allowing the sector to use such a tool, we will allow to tackle problems like data quality inside the database, etc. And you are right when you say that there is no <clears throat> in interesting tool that is not used. So we are really waiting for getting the feedback from railway undertaking on how the root compatibility check compatibility check application is working, but it's still new. Now <clears throat> I would like to give the floor to the next panelist, David Dewey, and I would like David to explain us why having done that job with uh, the agency and the prototype link data can be an example that can be of interest for any replication through the European Commission. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Um, so, yeah, in, in answering this question, in fact, so we, we've discussed about databases, we've discussed about the registries. Uh, I have to admit, in fact, I, I'm not a data guy. So you might ask why, if I'm not a data guy, why am I in data services, a digit and leading that information and knowledge management? Uh, in fact, I, I have a, a nightmare where I, I wake up in a cold sweat and say, well, my, my job title is database administrator. Uh, I don't like the administration of data. What I love is using data. And I would say then throughout my career, the, the focus has been on using data to do visualization, to do data analytics, to do data quality. And uh, as Hans has just said about benchmarking, uh, even about prediction and building models. Um, and also now lately doing machine learning, doing AI, everything is about using the data. Why is uh, what we have done uh, with the agency such a good example? Number one, what is exceptional is that the people involved are all about using data. And going down, I mean, in terms of the number of stakeholders, the breadth of stakeholders, the infrastructure managers, the the railway undertakings, like Hans said, uh, but also going down in, in the, the, the manufacturers, the, the national safety authorities, the people involved all have this passion about using the data. It's not about the data itself, but this is the main point. And most of my career then has been about doing data exchange with member states, about building the interfaces. Um, this, this work involves then building the data models, doing the harmonization, the core data components. What we try, what we have tried to do here is turn everything around. So the last 20 years has been so application centric with regards to developing these interfaces, developing uh, applications or the uses of data at the EC level, at agency level. Uh, we need to turn it around and we need to make everything data centric. We need to place uh, data in the role of a, of a first class citizen in everything that we build. And that is what really is about the, the example of um, not only the application, but all of the work that we have been building. Uh, I personally believe that in the next 10 years, all of the interesting applications that we are going to see built in the commission, but also throughout the agencies and also within the member states are going to be built on knowledge graphs. They're going to be built on the shared use, the reuse of data. And so the, 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 the sort of the, the jargon is, is to uh, break down the data silos. The data silos will not be broken down. When you drive through any member state, you will see grain silos. They're still there. They're empty. They may not be used. And I think that's going to be in the next 10 years. We're going to empty the silos and we're going to empty the silos into the knowledge graph. Um, why then in this example, is it particularly uh, replicable? Is it particularly interesting? Um, because we've built a great application. We've got an application that people can touch and feel and, and really get the, the understanding of why the interoperability of the data is so important and root compatibility check. They can see it in front of them. Uh, and, and this is exceptional because as I said, there's a, a wide range of stakeholders. There's heterogeneity in the data. 
The application also focuses on being able to update things. So it's fine to build a big knowledge graph. It's fine to build the backbone. But again, we'd be sinking into this data, the, the, the data silo approach of saying, OK, we've built it, now it runs. What uh, we have tried to do is build something that we know is going to be a basis for expansion. The root, compatibility, the root compatibility check, therefore, is is a great use case because it's the foundation use case of being able to build on all of the other registries that are at ERA and to make this emptying of the silos actually occur. Uh, and I would also say then it's also something when I say when you can touch and feel it, there has been enormous amounts of work in the commission uh, with publications office, with people who are working on semantic technologies and building the vocabularies, the ontologies. Uh, there's been great projects uh, recently as well with Cohesio in terms of building something that people can use on the basis of linked data and, and on the basis of a knowledge graph. Uh, but here again, with the, the specific example that we have, uh, we are building on a foundation that other things can be added later, that the data can be updated in a simple way, uh, and that people get a concrete, tangible understanding of what does it mean to use linked data and what does it mean to exploit the knowledge graph uh, with very, very practical questions um, as, as Hans has, has just uh, has gone through in his presentation. So that for me is the key answer to, to your question. Many thanks, David, many thanks. Now I would like to give the floor to Ivo Velichkov. Ivo, I re just recall quickly, you are a linked data consultant and trainer working with DigiDigit. Digit. Three questions for you, Ivo. First, why are linked data and knowledge graph relevant approaches from IT perspective to tackle this, uh, this root compatibility check business case? Second question, to which extent linked data is used in other domains or businesses? And third, Hosting error registries using knowledge graph technology offers a number of opportunities. What are, according to you, the most important ones? Please, Ivo. So why are linked data and knowledge graph relevant approaches? Uh, well, because the, the root compatibility check works on data available from independent sources and it, it is in different formats using different data models. It simply has to be unified. It's better to unify it to a generic form and use agreed standards. Uh, why? Well, on a personal level, we experience that every day. We use browsers to get content from every website and we are able to because our browsers connect to them using the same protocol and the content is represented using the same markup language. We, we can't imagine uh, another way of doing it. But that's not the case everywhere yet with data. Uh, and then uh, it is something already established and recommended way for data integration, at least in the public sector. Uh, I'll share now in the chat uh, a study by the Interoperability Program ICE of the European Commission, published in uh, already 2013, uh, which just says that this is the recommended way to integrate data and explains uh, why. So what uh, was recommended is what ERI is actually doing now. So it is now in the chat, I believe. And the next question, to which extent data, linked data is used in other domains? Well, linked data is used everywhere, but it's not so visible. In fact, every one of us um, use it daily through Google. Uh, this knowledge box on the right, when we search for places like restaurants and hospitals or for, for books, events, uh, people, it appears uh, because of the same principles that are, that are supported there. And then um, uh, many, many big, uh, well-known private companies use knowledge graphs and uh, most of these knowledge graphs, they are using uh, linked data uh, principles as well. So I'm going to share something which Professor uh, Halmeren from, from the University of Amsterdam uh, collected as uh, some examples of popular companies using knowledge graphs and most of them use linked data. In European institutions, it is used by uh, Publications Office, Council of EU, RTD, uh, VG Connect, Joint Research Center, uh, Eurostat, uh, European Environmental Agency, Patent Office, Digital Employment, uh, and many others. Uh, and um, so the, the last question was, um, 
hosting and registers are using knowledge graph technology offer some uh, of opportunity. So what are they? When when you make your data available as semantic knowledge graph, then it is self-describing so that it can be used in use cases and contexts that are not known at the moment. So different external stakeholders can build applications and services using the data provided from air knowledge graph and combine it with other sources without requiring any change and respectively any additional investment on that. Uh, I think that's the, the main thing. It deals with uh, with change and deals with uh, heterogeneous sources and it doesn't uh, bring technical debt unlike many other alternative approaches. Many thanks Ivo. Many thanks and the links you were referring to were published on huh, the chat. So. Many thanks. Now I would like to give the floor to Hank, Hank Mulder. So just recall briefly that you are head of digital cargo at AICA and you are team lead for the semantic modeling in DTLF, the Digital Transport and Logistics Forum. And my question precisely, my first question for you is, what is DTLF, please? Can you explain us what it is? Then my second question will be, could you elaborate the reasons why DTLF chose the semantic interoperability approach? And then, what does it mean in practice? Please, Hank. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, as an airline person, I'm a bit of a stranger here, but you'll, you will understand why it's very relevant. Um, and in that case, the DTLF, the Digital Transport and Logistics Forum, which is a European um, forum um, under DG, DG Move, um, was created to bring together uh, participants and stakeholders from all the different transport modes, but also from all the logistic different sectors, including manufacturing, both public and private. Uh, so it's it's a big group. We have something like 120 members from around Europe. And the objective, and I'm just going to read the one from the website because it's really well written, is the overall objective is a full scale digital interoperability and data exchange in a shared, secured and trusted transport and logistics data space. I love that word. Um, but the word we should focus on is interoperability. And, and in the European interoperability framework, there are different elements like legal, organizational, technical, and semantic interoperability. So already there's an indication that interoperability requires a semantic approach. And once you start talking semantic, you, you quickly get into the world of uh, digital twins, um, whether that is for devices, things or people, uh, but also processes. And so we're not just focusing on the semantics of the world around us, but also how the world interacts. And so the, the strength of this forum is actually in its diversity. The fact that we have all of these different industry sectors means that the conversation has to deal with all of the issues of everybody. I mean, what you have discovered is the challenges within the real sector, but now you add all the other sectors, the challenges are of a different level, but as you'll see, it actually gets easier. Um, it is also a very diverse group when it comes to the state of digitalization. We have many members that are very comfortable with paper still. And on the other range, the other end, we have people that are working with AI and blockchain and modern technologies, and of course, semantics. And so we have that whole range in between and reflected in that range is also the skill sets of the people that we're dealing with, with the representatives. And so when we're having these conversations around, you know, trying to come up with semantic models, using ontology, using semantic technologies, we have to be very careful because before you know it, you've lost 90% of the people you're supposed to be speaking with. And so this is then also a weakness, right? And the way that we deal with that uh, when we want to engage on semantic technologies as, as a solution to interoperability um, is that we have to learn. The, the, the forum exists already six years, no doubt it'll be there still in four years time. So you look at the 10 year time frame, a lot of these technologies evolve very fast. And so not only do we have to understand what they are and what they were, but also what they're going to be. And so we need to uh, learn. We also have to educate the people around us, the people within the forum, but also around in the various industries. And uh, communicate is a big part of it. Now, initially, we didn't know that, right? When we said, oh, let's do semantics, we, we were just talking about it and realized we lost everybody. What we have found is that you can actually discuss semantic technologies with people that aren't quite at that level yet. And so we have different conversations, for example, to the paper people, we actually have a very simple message. 
you have to do at least electronic business, preferably digital, but at least electronic. So that's an easy one. To the people, to the EDI, the EDI people, and honestly, in, in most uh, EU and around the world, uh, from our experience, e EDI is like 90% of the electronic data exchange. And so to those people, we say, we'll make sure that our semantics can reflect your data that is locked up in your document, your electronic documents, and somebody will figure out some sort of converter or translator. And the reason we have to say that is we don't want to lose them. We want to make sure that they don't worry and, and, and the comment on silos are like that. There's a lot of silos out there. We don't want to empty them immediately, right? We don't want them to run away from us. So we'll say we'll find a way of getting the data out of your silos into a semantic world. And then we have the API people that are comfortable with APIs and databases and exchange of data via that way. And to them we say, you need to sort of grow up a little bit and go beyond your data models. Your data models are great. You know, they're, they're, they're being well developed. They're all there, they're working, people are using them. But now you need to start thinking semantics because not only can you generate your data models from semantics, you can also, from semantic data models, sorry, you can also expand them without breaking the model. So that's a nice one. And then the last category is the ontology people, the people that are already doing this. And so then we say, you know, great, let's federate. And, and you know, obviously ERA that you're aware well, is a great example of that. But at IATA, the air transport industry, we're doing exactly the same thing. We've also published an ontology. There's lots of implementations happening at the moment. And our, our objective is to connect all of the transport sector around the world with all of the various stakeholders, uh, including, you know, upstream and downstream, all the way from the shipper to the consignee, which then touches on other modes of transport. And that then takes you to interoperability with other modes. Um, what does it mean in practice? In practice, it means that the actual work that the DTLF has to do and its associated projects is actually far more limited than you might think after this explanation. Because all the, the work for a specific transport sector is already done, right? In, in this case, ERA has done a fantastic job and you're right up there at the top level of where you need to be. But all of the other transfer modes have their own standards and their own solutions to data sharing. Um, and most of them have solutions for it, even if paper is still prevalent. And so the, the DTLF as a interoperability framework from a semantic perspective doesn't have to worry about the stuff that happens within the sector, which is 95% of what happens. If you think about it, when you transfer freight from a lorry to a train or from a lorry to, a, to an airplane, that, that interface is very small. What happens afterwards, what happens before, is for the sectors. And so the DTLF only has to worry about what happens in these the relatively limited transactions, which is probably only about 5% of the overall effort. And so you might see that, that such a model is like the glue between the various sectors and the various parts of the industry. We did a really exciting test, and Hugh uh, referred to it earlier. Last week, we, we connected the, the, the ERA world, um, you know, the two from two different databases that were mentioned earlier on with the federated ontology. And so we made a query that, that sort of dipped into this rail world, but also the federated world that the EU is working on. And, and I wasn't there sitting when the person wrote the code, but I reckon it didn't take more than 10 minutes to do that query. And for me, that was very much a man on the moon moment where, you know, to the person that did it, that was really easy, right? You step off and you're there, you're on the moon. In this case, the ability to connect completely separate sectors that have worked completely independently using these technologies is, is an absolute winner. And it's definitely where, where I see the future going. I'm very here to, happy to hear that the other speakers think alike. Um, I think that probably answers all of the questions that you had. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hank. And uh, while I'm picturing this man on the moon, uh, I would like to uh, say that unfortunately the clock is ticking and it's now time to conclude. We won't have time to uh, to answer the questions that were uh, raised today in the chat, but don't worry, they will be answered later on. And all the answers will be published on the ERA website. Before giving the floor to Christopher Carr, our head of executive office and the communication unit at ERA for a final word, I would like to thank uh, very warmly our speakers, all of you for their good contribution and participation today. It was a real pleasure to have you with us. Now I'm very happy to give the floor to Christopher Carr, please. 
Thank you, Cyril. And, and if I may join you in thanking the speakers, but also the uh, the attendees today. And, of, and as you said, of course, we will uh, answer the questions that have been posted and, and get back to those people who, who ask them. I want to say just a, a few a few words in summary. I mean, it's clear, I think, for all of us that data is increasingly uh, a topic which captures our imagination and, and drives a lot of what we see in the world around us. And, and rail is no uh, no different to that, and it's increasingly part of the debate we have in all our areas of work. What we're excited about at the agency here is that we we want to work to unlock the operational and business value behind the data that we host. Um, we think we have a role to play, a, a role to play in governance, but also uh, because we find the challenge rewarding and, and we're motivated to do it, we want to, we're happy to work um, as a facilitator where we can. We, you know, we're part of the, of the ecosystem and we want to make our contribution along with the stakeholders and along with our, our partners. The linked data approach that we've taken here to, it's clear to us already from the, from this that the work we've done is it allows us to be more flexible, it allows us to adapt faster, it allows us to be ready to support links across different modes and, and to to understand a little bit more the impact uh, of the different uh, work that we're doing and to, to identify areas that we can we can work more on. Of course, it doesn't automatically solve the problems, and I think some of the speakers have. Have, have picked that up. You know, we still got to look at things around data quality, the governance, the reference data identification. Those kinds of things are still things that we need to do. We need to work on, um, and, and the approach itself doesn't automatically fix that. But what we have found with our in our small uh, work so far is that where where we've created a, a business need, a business benefit from from the data we use, we see data quality naturally improving. People want it to work better. They want the gaps filled. They, they want to use it. And that drives a little bit the data quality rather than it being maps a static obligation that, that people didn't necessarily make so much use of. So I think that's for us uh, a key element. I would say our orientation is, I mean, uh, Evo said it, you know, all around us, everything we do today, we're, we're kind of using using this, this this approach and technology, that's the direction of travel. Uh, and we're also converging, I think, with the wider EC data strategy. Uh, so to show that we are, we're all fully aligned. But, you know, as we've said, we, we, we need to do it with our stakeholders. So so those we're working with, our partners, uh, and, and that's really what motivates us. And we want to, I want to thank those people and to, and to urge those of you who are uh, inspired by this, get, get in touch and to, to help us build this, this approach uh, and make a real success of it. And with that, I think I would, I'd like to finish by thanking again our speakers. And, uh, and I look forward to some really uh, exciting collaboration and, and future developments. Thank you, Cyril. Many thanks, Chris, for this conclusion. We are now reaching the end of this webinar. A huge thanks to all of our speakers and all the ERA colleagues involved in the preparation of this webinar. Thanks for your participation, dear attendees. Before you go, we would be very happy to receive your feedback on this webinar via the link provided on the webinar webpage on the ERA website or via the QR code you're seeing right now on the screen and that you can flash with your smartphone. But I'm sure you all know how to use a QR code now. We look forward to meeting you again at our upcoming webinar on the 25th of November for a joint webinar with another, another EU agency, ENISA, the EU Cybersecurity Agency, on managing cybersecurity risks in railways. If you would like to stay updated on our activities, please sign into our database by selecting the, the button My Era Profile on our website page. Thank you very much for participating. We wish you a very pleasant evening. Take care.